Hey everyone, good evening. Welcome to, uh, I think this is week nine of our CBE study. And Pastor Scott tonight is on the voyage back from his 60th birthday escapade. So it is, um, it's just me this evening. I feel like I'm like, it's like Simon and Garfunkel, but you just get Garfunkel tonight. Um, so, uh, or Simon, whoever. Um, so you all ask questions, help engage. I, I love it when you guys share things you've noticed. In fact, part of the part of the goal with CB is that we've done a lot. Pastor Scott and I have done a lot of kind of lecture format, which helps with a group that's bigger like ours is. But um, really, the goal with these is that uh, it would be a conversation. So as you guys, as you have things that that have bothered you or you've been struck by please um put those in the chat i'll do i'll monitor that tonight as well and um or, or speak up we got our our new speakers here so everybody that's in person can hear those of you online um so tonight we're going to look at two books we're going to look at obadiah which is the shortest book of the old testament um and then we're going to look at another one of the major prophets Ezekiel. We'll look at the first half of, um, of, his, of his book. And uh, just a couple of announcements before we, we dive in tonight. Um, first of all, uh, Veterans Day today, so we give thanks for all those who served our country. Um, wearing my Marine Corps marathon shirt in honor of those um, who uh, have served in that branch of the service. And um, any of you, any of you veterans? I know David. Anybody else? All right. Thank you for um, your sacrifices on behalf of our country. Um, it's also my father-in-law Dean's birthday. He's the one, um, the top of my screen with the green vest. So happy birthday to uh, my father-in-law Dean. And he's taking time out of his birthday to come study the prophets with us. So um, what could be better than having have him with us? Uh, on Monday night, just so another friendly reminder, we have Bob McKillop, the head men's basketball coach at Davidson College. He's going to be on a Zoom with us, and the theme will be how to be a person of resilience in challenging times. And so uh, it's open to anybody. You can register on Realm, and it'll be about an hour long, 7 p.m. on Monday night, and uh, should be a really, really uh, stimulating conversation to hear more of his story. He taught at Long Island Lutheran School mm -hmm. and was the um, became the head of that school while um, one of our church members, Dick Ingebrecht, was the superintendent of those schools. So they met each other, and that's the connection with, with Coach McKillop. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention tonight before we begin is some of you may have wondered about the governor's announcement for uh, in-person and council, church council is going to meet on Monday night. They'll talk about what impact that may have on in-person gatherings. It probably won't impact worship um, initially, but uh, with our classes, including this one, um, it may or may not have a shape on whether we can continue until he lifts that um, in early December. So we'll keep you posted, um, but that'll be on Monday that... Uh, that the council will discuss that further. Let's open with prayer. Father, we thank you for um, bringing us together again tonight to study your word. Um, Lord, there's a lot of different things we could use our time on, and yet we know that your word is living and active, and it continues to speak to us today, Lord, even in a book like Ezekiel that is so full of symbolism and um, we pray that you would help us to uh, understand it better, um, that you would help it apply to our life, and ultimately you'd help us to hear your gospel um, as you call us to follow you. Um, all this we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. All right, well, let's spend uh, just a little bit of time on Obadiah since um, we, were, we began the week with with, uh, with this obscure prophet. Um, so Obadiah has kind of an interesting um, audience. 
you know, unlike some other, um, most of the other prophets who are speaking to God's people, uh, Obadiah is speaking to this little nation of Edom. And let's go back and review the history again. So in the Old Testament, you have um, the Lord comes and brings a covenant and makes a covenant with Abraham and Sarah. And they're well into their 90s. And God says, you're going to be the, the parents of a multitude. And by their faith in God's promise, uh, God sees and declares them righteous. It's one of the first times we're told that a person is righteous by their faith and not by their works. Uh, with Abraham and Sarah believing. And they have two, two sons. The first son is um, Ishmael. And, um, but that actually, that actually is not Sarah's um, son. It's the son of uh, the maidservant, Hagar. And God says, well, um, that's not the one through whom this promise will come. It'll come to the one that I made the covenant with, with Sarah and with you. And they have another son whose name is what? Isaac. Isaac. Right, so then Isaac marries Rebecca, and um, remember Isaac's name is Laughter, his, um, because Sarah and Abraham laugh at the audacity of God to make such a credible <laughs> promise to them. They just can't, they can't um, help but laugh. And uh, so then Isaac marries Rebecca, and they have two sons, and um, they're they're twins, right? Mm -hmm. So the first one. The first one comes out, and what's he like? Anybody remember? Hairy, hairy. He's hairy. Yeah. He's got he's got all this red hair, and he's um, uh, he's named Esau, and holding on to his heel, clinging to his older brother's foot, is the other son, who is Jacob, right? Um, so then there's there's a feud between them. Partly because of Jacob deceiving Esau, taking the birthright that had been promised to the oldest son, initially Esau. And there's this bad blood between these two brothers and then these two peoples who come from them forevermore after that, it seems like. Well, Jacob, of course, is renamed what? Israel. Israel. He wrestles with God in the nighttime um, by the river Jabbok. And the, he's renamed the one who wrestles with God, Israel. And the other, um, the other brother, Esau, of whom God says, I'm also going to make a great nation from you, is <coughs> father of the Edomites, the Edomites. So this, this neighbor, uh, Edom, they're the descendants of Esau. And they live in the heights. There's mountains where Edom is. It's a very uh, hilly place. They're also known for their wisdom. They, they were, had a reputation for being a people of great um, learnedness. And um, what happens is after Judah and Jerusalem fall, uh, Babylon comes in and begins to cart them away. What does Edom do? Do they come over and say, we're going to help you, dear friend. We're so sorry this has happened to you. Let's lend you a hand and support you. No. They kick a man while he's down. They see an opportunity to, um, to go into uh, Judah and take advantage, to steal things, to plunder. And the message of Obadiah is really this rebuke of God to Edom, um, that uh, their pride. So if you look on um, the first, the first, uh, the first page. There's only one chapter in Obadiah, so the first page on uh, it'd be uh, page um, 357. Notice the themes. You know, Obadiah kind of plays off the fact that they they're in this mountainous area, and it's a symbol of their kind of a playing off of their pride that they think well. You know, now we've finally gotten the better. You stole our birthright way back then. Well, now look who is um, is doing better than you, Jacob. And so Obadiah says, see, I'll make you small among the nations. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who live in the clefts of the rocks, make your home on the heights. You say, who can bring me down to the ground? And so God is, is um, prophesying that, well, God will. Because this is the story of humanity. Pride cometh before a fall. 
that when we when we elevate and we think, you know, we don't need the Lord, we can do it ourselves, that that's when the Lord humbles. He, um, he teaches that by ourselves, uh, we're mere mortals. We can't, we can't be sufficient. On the top of 358, God declares, In that day will I not destroy the wise men of Edom, those of understanding, in the mountains of Esau. And uh, so there's that reference to their wisdom, their, um, their learnedness. That makes me think about Paul. You know, when Paul in the New Testament he talks about, you know, what is what is Christ going to be? Christ is going to be a, um, a stumbling block to the to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. That you know, the wisdom he says, you know, the wisdom of God is stronger, or wiser than human strength. Um, but that this, you know, the worldly wisdom that kind of thinks that it can figure out God, God is going to humble that. Uh, before the cross. So um, prophecy there down at the bottom, it says the day of the Lord is near for all nations as you have done, it will be done to you. That God's going to um, bring this back on them. But on 359, after God, God prophesies this, there is this, um, this little message of hope. So somebody, somebody of these prophets, they have all these words of judgment. They always end with like a little glimmer of hope. And so the very end of it says, deliverers will go up to Mount Zion to govern the mountains of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. Um, so there's this there's prophecy that deliverers, people who will rescue, will, um, will again govern, govern Esau. And one thing I think that's helpful to point out, too, is right before Obadiah, there are two other books. There's the book of Joel, whom we'll get to, and the book of Amos that we already read. One thing Joel is really intentional in saying is, all who call on the Lord will be saved. It's a famous passage Paul's going to quote and the New Testament is going to quote, which includes who? It includes Esau. It includes Edom. All who are going to call on the Lord will eventually be saved, including Edom. And then Amos has similar prophecies about um, uh, Esau and all the peoples being gathered to God. Uh, so there's, I think it's intentional maybe that they put those two books before Obadiah to show how God would deliver them too. Finally, I wanted to say about this book is some people think there's a little bit of a play on words as well. Edom is a lot like the Hebrew word Adam, which means man or humanity and so why why devote a book to Edom well partly what it's showing is the story not just of this little obscure nation but it's showing the story of, of humanity of Adam that is so our pride pulls us away from the Lord um, God humbles God brings back to uh, the true knowledge of him <clears throat> all right so we have a question here I'm gonna pull up the chat so Houston said, is the word Sephardic the same root as Sephardic? Houston, where did you where do you find that word in the Hebrew? Okay, uh, next to last verse, this company of Israelite exiles, yeah. uh, exiles from Jerusalem who are in Sephardic, will possess the towns of the Negev mm -hmm. and Sephardic. Mm -hmm. There, there are two basic. Uh, Historic streams of uh, the Israelites after after the uh, after the Babylonian captivity, one is Sephardic and one is uh, Ashkenazic. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a connection there. It yeah. sounds way too similar, but I don't know. I don't know what that um, what that connection is. If you do some more research, let us know. Will do. All right. <laughs> Good deal. Um, another question from Libby uh, says, Jeremiah 31, 34, page 306. And can God's covenant be broken? I'm worried about these passages. Um, 306. Only if the heavens can be measured and the foundation of the earth below be searched out, only then will I reject all the descendants of Israel. And 310, if you can break my covenant with the day, my covenant with the night, so that day and night no longer Come at their point in time, only then will my covenant be broken. All right. 
So, um, yeah, thank you for that follow-up. I mean, those. So my, question, my question is, I'm one of those people who who worries about things like that. What if the sun doesn't come up tomorrow? <laughs> then it's going to be very cold <laughs> um, spiritually and physically. But, um, you know, I think that's a great question. I think that, um, uh, you know, obviously I think what, G, what, what God is wanting to illustrate there is that likelihood is so infinitely small um, that the, uh, the sun will come up as far as we, we hope and pray and trust. Uh, but just that constancy that every morning, and every night there would be a reminder of the faithfulness of God's covenant, the dependability of it. Um, only if something as predictable as the sun and the moon were to go away, that God could be um, could be deprived of that. Yeah, good. I'm sure that's meant to be reassuring, but with um, global warming and, and concerns about that, <laughs> I'm right. a little nervous. <laughs> That's a, yeah, that's an interesting take on that. Um, but I think you're right. I think it is meant to be reassuring for sure. Um, good. Any other thoughts, questions on Obadiah? Not a prophet many kids these days are named after. Um, <laughs> all right, let's, let's go to Ezekiel. Because there is a lot in here, a lot packed in here. So there was a rabbinic tradition um, for many, many, many years that Ezekiel was so symbolic and so otherworldly at times that you weren't permitted to even study it until you were 30 years old because they didn't want um, they didn't want teenagers and children to be frightened by the images or to misunderstand them. So. Um, it's kind of a unique book, and the, the, the rabbis put this um, guardrail around it. Uh, and as we'll see, as you, as you read this week, you saw that there are a lot of really um, uh, unusual and interesting, fascinating passages, including, most of all, the ones about this vision of God and the glory of God that he sees. Um, so Jeremiah, or Ezekiel, um, so like, like Jeremiah, he's a priest, and he um, I didn't know this until I was doing some, some more study, but another thing that was significant about the age 30 in biblical times is that's the age when you could begin your priestly duties in the temple. So, you know, before then you would, you would be training, you'd be going to your seminary or the equivalent, but when you were 30, that's when you could go into the temple and start working as a priest. And so Ezekiel is finally, you know, he's more or less finally gotten close to that age. And right when that, when he's at that age is when um, the Babylonians tear down the temple and they carry them off to Babylon. And so his whole life, you know, he's a, a Levite, part of the tribe of Levi. Um, he's been dreaming, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This is my career path here. And suddenly, everything in his world is rocked. Now there's no temple to be a priest in. What am I going to do now? And part of what this first part of his story shows is how God is going to give him a new calling. I suspect that all of us at various points in our life, we envisioned doing one thing, one type of work, one type of ministry, living in a certain place. And we suddenly found ourselves going in a different direction or called to, be, to do something really different. And that's going to be true for, um, uh, for Ezekiel as well. It's three part, there's three parts in the book. Um, the first part's really concerning the, the oracles or the visions to um, God's people, Judah. And Ezekiel, as I said, he's, he's taken into exile. So now, again, we're chronological. He's been... Um, He's been one of those that's been carted off. And a couple of familiar words or phrases, 93 times in this book, God uses that phrase, son of man, son of man, son of man. Um, what does that mean? What do you think? Why would God use that so frequently, son of man? Um, it sounds like Jesus, the son of man. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 In the gospels, Jesus is called the son of man. And part of that is because in the prophet Daniel, um, 
Daniel has a vision of God. And he says, I saw one like a son of man coming. And so when Jesus is referred to as son of man, there's kind of a tie to that, that divinity aspect. So it's, it can be, it's, a, it's an interesting phrase. It can be used in both ways, both with some connotations of divinity, or on the other hand, can be a reminder of, of, of humanity, of, of, um, of your mortality. I think in Ezekiel's case, it's more that, you know, he's going to be given these incredibly unique visions of God, but yet God wants to remind him, don't forget you're an ordinary person. You know, don't, don't fall into the Edomite trap of thinking that you're, um, you're, you're really somebody bigger than your britches. And so there's that, maybe that's part of why he uses this phrase. Another phrase is the word of the Lord came, the word of the Lord came, or thus saith the Lord. So a lot of times that phrase gets used in Ezekiel uh, to, to remind us that it's not Ezekiel's word, uh, but God's. So uh, chapter one, page 365. There are many stories in the Bible we can date down to the very day. But Ezekiel, we can because he tells us not just the year, but the month, the day of the month. And then we know based on when the exile happened in 587 um, and then calculating out on where these months are in the Jewish calendar, which is different, of course, from our calendar, that it's in the 30th year. So, again, there's that significant number. He's right at his priestly age. And the fourth month on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles at the river, the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. So in case you're wondering, this is July 31st, 593, 593. And the way the calendar played out, that seems like six years, but it happened. The exile happened at the end of that 587. Um, so 593, very specific. And a lot of times they... You know, I think people think you know, that's to help justify the factuality and the, the historical nature of this vision. It tells us the exact date. Now, if you were to have, if you were a director in a Hollywood movie and you had to describe what God will look like, how would you do that? How would you begin to paint a picture of what the Lord looks like? Would you use Morgan Freeman, like some movies have done with the deep, booming voice or... Um, uh, how would you begin? Would it be a blinding light that is too bright to behold? Um, well, this is what this is what uh, Ezekiel sees while he's in exile. Now, that's an important point too. Um, God's going to come to him in the exile. You know that he's not confined to the temple. He can go to us wherever we're at, no matter how bad the circumstances are. Of our life, God can come there. So he says, I looked, I see a windstorm from the north. There's flashing lightning surrounded by brilliant light. So far, maybe so normal or what we would expect. But all of a sudden, he sees four living creatures. In appearance, they're formless human, but each of them had four faces, four wings. And their legs are straight, feet like calf. And they have these wings, faces. And their faces look like this. One's of a human being. One had a lion. One was a lion. One was an ox. And one was an eagle. Does that sound familiar at all? Those, those four types of faces. Anything else you can think of with that? I was just wondering if they stood for some nations. But I don't know. Uh -huh. Different. A lot of times... The nations will have kind of a, a, an animal to represent them. That's a great point. Like uh, um, Judah is the lion of Judah. It's a great, great thought. Any other references you can think of? Some point, some people think what this is pointing to is throughout the scriptures, these four um, beings have qualities that are praised by the Bible. So the human, the image of God. The um, reflection of God's glory. Um, the, uh, the eagle is prized in the word in the Psalms and Jeremiah for its speed, its stateliness, its kind of grandeur, but its swiftness. The lion for its strength, its courage. Um, the oxen, which is 
a symbol of sacrificial love, of giving life. It gives its life for others. So what some people think this vision of God is portraying is that um, God is, is the glory of God. It's the strength of God. It's the swiftness, and it's the sacrificial giving of God. That kind of God's whole being is being portrayed through these animal um, symbols of the four living creatures. But what they're doing is they're bearing these, um, um, this throne upon them. And there are these wheels, and these wheels are, are um, they're very, I had to really study this carefully. I mean, it's, they're strange. They're spinning around, they're intersecting, and um, they, it can move, kind of like a, ch a chair that's a rolling chair where the wheels can turn. So the chair can go any way without the wheel, without the chair turning, but the wheels are turning. That's kind of what the image is suggesting. And the, um, the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And it says on 366 that there came a voice from above the vault over their heads. High above the throne was a figure like that of a, of a man. So now Ezekiel is seeing above the four creatures, above the wheels, the figure of, um, of looks like a man. And from the waist up looks like glowing metal full of fire, brilliant light. What this reminds me of, too, is Revelation, when the Apostle John sees the vision of God and those four creatures. Now, they're different. They're not exactly the same, but um, if you're having a vision of God and you have to write it down afterwards, um, either you may, you may write it or record it somewhat differently, or it may have appeared differently. Um, but so this is what Ezekiel is seeing, this incredibly um, mysterious and beautiful uh, vision of the Lord. And it says, this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. I saw it and I fell face down and heard the voice of the one speaking. So there's this reverence here that when he sees God, he falls down in a posture of worship. He's just, he's just so in awe of, of uh, what God does. Um, I think part of what this is happening is God's getting Ezekiel's attention. What does God have to do to get our attention? If God wanted to bring us a clear message tonight, what would God have to, how would God have to reveal himself, God's self, to, sh to really have us pay attention? Well, he's got Ezekiel's attention now. And the next part, this is the start of chapter 2, bottom of 366. I really, I like how God says, he says, now, son of man, stand up on your feet. Servants stood before their king. You know, they would stand to receive their orders. So he's reverenced himself in worship. Now he's to stand and to receive his direction. And, and I'll speak to you. But listen, as he spoke, the spirit came into him and raised him up, which is such a great um, reminder of how the spirit of God gives us the strength to do what God asks. Um, and that's going to come into play more here. Son of man, I'm sending you to the Israelites, to rebellious nation. They've rebelled against me to this very day. They're stubborn. Whether they listen or fail to listen, they will know that a prophet has been among them. So don't be afraid, though briars and thorns are all around you. You must speak my words to them, whether they listen or fail to listen. For I, um, for I am with you. So why would God send Ezekiel to this people, whether they are going to listen or fail to listen? But God's saying, they're stubborn, I can tell you, they're not going to listen. But I'm going to send you anyway. One but, last chance. <laughs> one last chance, yeah. He still pursues. Right, there it is. He still pursues. That even when the people are um, uh, completely uh, made up their, their heart not to receive the message. God's still pursuing, still sending a prophet. And I think that's that's a huge part of this. Um, and it's like Jesus says in the Gospels, do unto others as you would have them do to you. Uh, God doesn't wait for love to come to him. He goes out in love first to try to save, to speak truth. Um, so this is an example of God having Ezekiel do that as his messenger. 
And how's he going to do this? Well, he's going to start with him eating something very strange at the top of 367. He says, look and eat, open your mouth and eat what I give you. Um, so remember with uh, Isaiah, God touches his mouth with a burning coal. Um, with Jeremiah, God touches his mouth and gives him the word. Ezekiel gets even more. He gets to eat or consume the word of God. And how hungry would you have to be to eat a big old scroll? With, um, <laughs> you'd have to be pretty hungry, right? And on the outside, are, there are written words like funeral songs and, and doom and lament because he knows that um, there's this message that's going to be hard to deliver. But uh, he, he eats the word, and it says it tastes not bitter like you might expect, but it's honey. It's like so sweet. Um, you know, and this goes back to the old adage that before we can share the word, before we can share our faith, we have to digest it. We have to internalize it. We have to be in it. So this is, I think, a picture of, of Ezekiel um, consuming, being really familiar, intimate with God's words that he can, um, he can take it out. A little further down, he says, look, I'm not sending you to this other people. If, you, if I sent you to the Gentiles, they'd all listen. But because I'm sending you to Israel, they won't listen to you. But I'm going to make you your forehead like hard stone, harder than flint. In other words, I'm going to give you courage and dedication. And God is giving Ezekiel the fortitude that he's going to need to do something really hard. And I think the lesson there is that when God calls us to something really hard or difficult, God will supply what you need. Um, he will provide for that. And I know um, many of you have experienced that personally. Then um, the Spirit continues to reveal us at the bottom of that section on 367. It says, the Spirit then lifted me and took me away, and I went in bitterness and the anger of my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord upon me. And I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Aviv near the Kabar River. And there where they were living, I sat among them for seven days, deeply distressed. Why do you think Ezekiel sits there for seven days after all of this? He needs some time to process. I think he, well, to identify with his people, with God's people. To sit among them, um, yeah, to listen, good. Tel Aviv, by the way, means in Hebrew, the hill of the ears of corn. Uh, I had to mention that since it is my, I mentioned it, my father-in-law's birthday today. He lives out in the corn fields of Iowa. So the hill of the ears of corn, um, that's uh, it's like sitting in the, by the river in Decorah, Iowa. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it, it is to identify with the people because he, he, he needs time to let this sink. Before he goes out and continues his uh, his message. All right. First uh, first thing he's to do, 367 at the bottom, he's to be a watchman. This phrase, be a watchman for the people of Israel. In other words, um, when you see things that are not of the will, speak uh, correct. Um, when things are going well, speak to those too. And then the bottom of that section on 368, it says God's going to make him, is either his tongue stick to the roof of his mouth so he'll be silent and unable to rebuke. But when I speak, I'll open your mouth and you'll say to them, this is what the Lord says. So <clears throat> there are times where God provides the words. Um, when it's genuinely a word that will give life, it has to be God who supplies the words. So he's going to wait for that there. And also in that section, we hear more about the glory of the Lord. And that's going to be a key theme. That's going to be a key theme in Ezekiel is the glory of the Lord. What I, I wanted to um, reference at, at this point is, remember back to when Solomon built the temple. You know, after David was told, you're not going to build it. Your son's going to build it. Solomon constructs the temple. They have a big uh, ceremony to dedicate the temple and they're all they're sacrificing they're praying and suddenly we're told that 
the glory of the Lord filled this temple in an overwhelming way. The, the, um, the light, the cloud, the priest couldn't even go inside. There was this glory, God's palpable presence there. Part of what Ezekiel is going to wrestle with is now that the people have been exiled and the temple's torn down, what happens to the glory of God? You know, where does it go? What's it, what does it do? And, um, and so we're going to build to that in this first part of Ezekiel here. Bottom of 368. Kind of like uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel does these um, action prophecies. These really um, visual aids to showing what God is uh, up to. And there's some really weird ones that Ezekiel does. I'm not sure that um, if God had commanded me to do some of these, I would have been, I would have been scratching my head pretty uh, pretty hard. First one is he says, take a block of clay, and I want you to draw the outline of Jerusalem on it, set it there, and then and look at it, and but place an iron pan in front of it so that um, that represents the division between God and the people of the city, that there's this, um, this block caused by uh, people's rebellion. So in other words, he's kind of being told to play, like to have these little mini, mini uh, city scene, and the people are walking by and going, what is Ezekiel doing? I mean, that he's acting out with, um, with little figures, uh, what God is, um, is doing here. And then he's told this, then lie on your left side and put the sin of the people of Israel upon yourself. You're to bear the sin uh, for the number of days as you lie on your side. For how many days? 390. 390 days. Now, some people say there's no way he could have laid there on his left side for 390 days. So maybe it meant every day at some point in the day, get up and go out and do that again. Probably a more reasonable right, uh, a claim. Why 390, 390 days? Well, some people think that the, the number of days, uh, or years rather, from the first king of Judah, who was the son of Solomon, his name was Rehoboam, until the last one at the exile, Zedekiah, was around right at 390 years. So he's being told to lay on your side for as many days as these kings of Judah were ruling and um, led to this. So people think that's where the 390 comes from. And then after that's taken place, flip over on your right side and, um, and do the same thing there. Turn your face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and I'll tie you up with ropes. And then while you're there, to take a little bit of food and, and eat it um, as you're, you're lying here again. So he's showing, you know, in this uh, visual way, um, both his priestly duty of bearing the sin, which points to Christ being the high priest who bears the sin of the world, um, but also showing how God has cut off Jerusalem from, from the glory. Uh, the bottom of 369, another one of these. Now take your sharp sword and give yourself uh, a royal haircut. Um, Use it as a barber's razor. So you picture this sword, and he's shaving his um, head, which people did not do, and his beard, which the, the power of that is um, a priest was not allowed to shave their beard. And part of it, I think, is um, representing Ezekiel's new role. Now he's moved away from that old priestly identity to the prophet one. But he's to take part of the hair from his beard and to um, strike it with the sword, some scatter it to the wind, some tuck it in his garment. And all of that symbolized the, this judgment of God on the, on the people, um, that they've been unruly. Uh, but it's just a really dramatic way of, of illustrating that. Top of 374. Just a couple other um, little snippets from that uh, section. God says, you know, I will deal with them according to their conduct by their own standards. I will judge them. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Why is God doing all of this? For the same reason God did the plagues in Egypt. For the same reason God had, um, you know, had these consequences throughout the Old Testament. It's not just 
not to ultimately, you know, have the people further remove it so they would come to see that God is the Lord. Um, then they will know that I am, I am the Lord. God wants to call them um, back to the true worship there. All right. Bottom at 374. Another uh, exact day in here. This is September 17th, 592. And um, so he's been in he's been in the exile, he's been in Babylon, but now the Spirit's gonna take him to Jerusalem to see what is uh, gonna happen there regarding the glory of God. And so it says that he's sitting in his house. The elders of Judah were all sitting before Ezekiel, which says what about his um, his reputation? He's, he's an admired. He's, he's respected, even though he does a lot of unusual and odd um, things. They, they respect his um, prophetic voice. The hand of the sovereign Lord came upon me, and I saw a figure like that of a man. That's the second time in Ezekiel we've been told the divine's like a figure of a man, sort of pointing ahead to, um, to Jesus Christ. And again, from his waist down was like a fire. From up his appearance was as bright as glowing metal. He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head and lifted me up between earth and heaven and visions of God took me to Jerusalem. And he goes to the entrance of the north gate where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. So we're not sure exactly what that idol is, but it's some sort of um, either specific idol or it's a representative or a symbol of all these other idols that the people have been having, even in the temple, even in the holiest place. And... Um, he says he's told to dig a hole in the wall and see a doorway. And then at the top of 375, it says, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness? Each at the shrine of his own idol. They say the Lord doesn't see us. The Lord's forsaken the land. Um, you know, that phrase, what they're doing in the darkness. That uh, you know, remember John's gospel, the prelude, that the light shines in the darkness, that it represents that um, uh, place in which um, folks, where our, our human sinfulness, um, you know, needs to be revealed, needs to be um, shown. So I just thought that was uh, interesting there. Um, Tammuz, a little step down to another Babylonian um, goddess that the women are mourning to. And um, do you see the son of man? You'll see things that are even more detestable than this. So in other words, God's just showing them how the temple itself had become um, filled with these things that were not, not of the Lord. Then look down at, three, at the bottom of 375. Then I heard him call in a loud voice, bring near those who are appointed to execute judgment on the city, each with a weapon in his hand. So you have these six men that walk up, and they each have some sort of weapon. And with them, there's a man clothed in linen who has a writing kit at his side. And they come in, and they stand beside the bronze altar in the temple. So that's really highly symbolic language. And... Um, these six men of judgment represent the, um, the punishment. But this other one, he's got this uh, tablet. And God tells him, go throughout the city of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads of those who grieve and lament over all the detestable things um, that are being done in it. So what's God saying to do here? How would you, how would you define this? Separate those people from the yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. You know, this, this remnant or this um, group of people who have, um, who have refused to go along with the uh, things that are happening. They're being told to mark on the forehead um, those, those people. And what's Ezekiel's response? He, at the bottom he says, um, Alas, sovereign Lord, are you going to destroy the entire remnant of Israel in this outpouring of wrath on Jerusalem? And God answers, the sin of the people is exceedingly great. Not just great, but exceedingly. Um, the Lord is, they say the Lord has forsaken the land and does not see. 
Um, but the man in the linen with the writing kit brought it back to God and said, I've done as you commanded. And, uh, man, what is the, this is a scary scene, but what is the comfort here? Uh, we often talk as the church about being marked, about being sealed. In fact, every time we baptize a person, we, we do the prayers, we, we baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We ask a, a blessing on them that God would give them a spirit of wisdom and understanding, counsel and might, and knowledge, the fear of the Lord and joy in his presence, which comes right out of Isaiah and the seven gifts of the Spirit. But then, after we pray that prayer, we always go back to the water again. And we take a big thumbful of water and we, we trace on their forehead the same thing that was traced on your forehead. We say you've been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with what? The cross. The cross. The cross. The cross. And so I think part of what this is foreshadowing is um, this man in the linen who's going around is, 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 is Jesus. I mean, I think it's, it's foreshadowing Jesus who will mark us with the cross that spares us from the judgment, you know, that uh, spares us um, from the consequences of, of sin. Then I looked and I saw this, the throne again, and God says to fill your hands with the burning coals and scatter them all over the city. And so this is the scene of, um, of tossing the, uh, the coals around, which is the judgment kind of covering the city here. But the cherubim, these angelic beings, there's different types of angels that are talked about in the Bible. You've got um, the cherubim, and you might think of another name, at least one. We say it in our communion liturgy, traditional. The seraphim. Oh, seraphim, yeah, that's right. And so, and so there's different kind of hier hierarchy of angelic beings, and the, um, the cherubim help to scatter, to hold these, these coals here, and um, are part of this throne of God. But this is, this is a really pivotal chapter in Ezekiel. Now we're in chapter 10, and it says, Then the glory of the Lord rose from above the cherubim and moved to the threshold of the temple. So where's the glory of God? moved to. It's right at the edge of the, the doorway. You know, before it had been at the Holy of Holies, where the ark was stored. And this was the place where the high priest would go and um, once a year and would utter the name of God, the name that had been revealed to Moses at, at the burning bush in Mount Sinai. They would utter it. The, the typical a Jewish person would never speak that word aloud. And even today, many uh, Orthodox Jews won't say that name or write it. Um, they'll abbreviate it when they um, or with either G dash D or they'll put the letters Y H W H um, in their writings. But the priest would go into that holy of holies and would say this, and the glory of God would fill this holy space. But now you I mean with this Babylonian army tearing down the temple. Uh, God's glory is not going to stay there. And so the glory gets up and goes to the threshold. He looks, he sees the cherubim again with the four wheels. And um, uh, their bodies are completely full of eyes. Any thoughts on what that might represent? That all these things are just eyes all around. What's that conveyed? All seeing, all knowing, I guess. Yeah. All seeing, all knowing nature of God. We talk about God's, his omnipotence, his all-powerful nature. We talk about his omnipresence, his um, being able to be everywhere um, at once, um, but it's all-knowing. Somebody asked recently that, they said, well, how can God hear all our prayers at one time? You know, when, when we're, in, we're all praying around the world, how can God receive all of those and respond to them. And I heard this one uh, pastor's answer really thoughtful. I like, said, you know, if, our, if we take these every day and we make our phone calls and our, we call someone and they all go up to the satellite 
And the satellite can receive all these calls and direct them to their proper um, places. How much more can God do that? You know, that um, if a satellite in, in outer space can receive all these messages, then um, God, who's all seeing, who's all knowing, can receive our prayers our, um, and, um, and direct that. The top of 377. Now, what this, this says, we have to understand how, how devastating this really is. You know, what is the, what's the joy of Israel? What is the, what is the thing that made them unique? You know, all the other nations with all their claims to greatness, whether it's Egypt or Edom or um, Babylon or Assyria, none of them had the glory of the Lord. None of them could say, yes, but in our temple, we have the one true God who's truly promised to be present. And what we're seeing here with the glory of God in this strange vision moving up and leaving is now the one thing they can kind of count on to really protect the city and protect them has left. It's departed from the temple. And uh, it says they stopped at the entrance of the east gate of the Lord's house. Don't forget that. I want to come back to that in a little while because there's, there's going to be a... Um, full circle with this that it stopped at the east gate which was the king's gate or the sun gate every morning when the sun would rise in the east they had positioned this gate to shine right the sun would shine right through it um, that's where the glory of god is going to um to depart from here and it does then the spirit lifts them up and takes them to the gate of the house of the lord that faces east and um, there's a story on the bottom of 377, and then 378. You know when the first heart transplant in human history was? And I don't mean the one done by a medical doctor, because I'm not sure when that was. I remember reading about that, the person who had it done, but the first heart transplant in human history is on 378. When God promises this, um, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Although I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I've been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they've gone. So first of all, God is not fully, he's not abandoned them. God's still a sanctuary for them, even though the glory has left the temple. A little further down, though, God says, I'm going to bring you back. And... They'll return and remove all the vile images and detestable idols, and I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I'll remove from them the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. The first heart transplant. Um, a lot of our songs in worship, when they talk about, give me a clean heart, oh God, give me a new heart. They're pulling from this language from Ezekiel and it's, it's really closely related to the reading we had this past Sunday from Jeremiah, where God says, I'm going to make a new covenant with you that will be not like the old ones. I'm going to write it on your heart. And, um, of course, in the New Testament, that's, this is what is up and down. The, when Paul talks in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, they're a what? A new creation. Um, the God has to in baptism put to death the old creature, the one of stone, to give us a new life, a new heart. And only then, by that gift, can we follow the decrees, carefully keep the laws, although we know that it's, it's Jesus' righteousness and faithfulness who's operative in that, uh, leading us. And, um, and so there's this great gift of uh, hope right there in chapter 11. Any questions or thoughts so far? Let me stop there. Hey, Drew, I got one thing for you. Yeah. So early on, it was comment was made. What if the sun doesn't rise? You know, that's that's something to worry about. But the answer is found in Genesis chapter eight, verse twenty-two, which is right after the flood. And when Noah and, uh, 
and his family are released. You know, the waters recede and they come out. And the first thing Noah does is he builds uh, an altar and has an animal sacrifice to the Lord. And the verse says, you know, after Noah builds this altar, when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma of the sacrifice, he said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man, even though every inclination of his heart is evil from his, his youth. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. And the verse 22 says, as long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall never cease. Mm -hmm. So there's God's promise right after the flood. And of course, in Revelation, we know that the earth will die and be, be burned up and be renewed, be restored to its pre precursed -curse condition. But until then, you know, we have the promise uh, of night and day and uh, the seasons, you know, shall never cease. Awesome. That's so good. Thank you, Jonathan. Beautiful. Yeah, that's that's powerful. Bottom of 378, there's a couple more of these action prophecies. Now, this this seems to jump back chronologically to before the exile almost. So sometimes the prophets, when they're writing these down, remember they're not always in pure chronological order. I'm not sure why they might have done that, but because um, now it, there's um, there's this there are these two things that Ezekiel's told to do. The first one is he's told to pack a bag, and that they're to, he's to take his bag in daylight and to carry it out like he's he's going someplace just so that the people see that and go. Where are you going? He's like, we're about to be exiled. Um, so that's the first one. The second one, and at the top of 379, the people are even going to ask, what are you doing? Like, what's the meaning of this, this prophecy? Um, the second one on the middle of 379 is God says to Ezekiel, uh, tremble as you eat your food and shudder in fear as you drink your water. So he used to sit there and to be to tr be trembling as he's eating and drinking, so the people will um, will ask about that too. Uh, that there's this time of uh, of hard darkness to come. There's a couple more of those. And then at the bottom of 379, we hear what the people are really saying. They're saying, "This, you know, the days go by. Every vision comes to nothing. You know, these, these prophets they say these things are going to happen, but it never does." And God says. Say to them, the days are near when every vision will be fulfilled. That there'll be no more false visions or flattering divination, divin divinations. And I was just wondering, well, how many times have people thought, been tempted to think maybe, well, Jesus said he'd come back. And here we are 2,000 years later, and people, some people might say, well, yeah, well, does that mean that this isn't going to happen? We were called, as he says, always be prepared. It happen any day. And um, a little further in, there, either there's a judgment against these false prophets. They say peace when there's no peace. When a flimsy wall is built, they cover it with whitewash. Yeah. Any thoughts on why is God so concerned about the false prophets? I mean, why is that such a it comes up again and again in these in these books? What's that said to you all? Well, he's trying to prevent people from being led down the wrong path. I mean, if you if you send someone out with the truth, they've got other. They're hearing another story. Uh, it's drawing them away when they might be inclined to listen to Ezekiel, but if you've got another priest or prophet pulling them away. That's yeah, a, that's a problem. It's a problem, for sure. And I think so on that note, it shows how much God values truth. You know, if the reading for this coming Sunday will be from um, Ephesians chapter four, where Paul talks about the spiritual gifts. But he says, "In all things, speak the truth in love." You know that don't. You know there are there are ways of speaking that may sound loving. But they're not, if they're not truthful, they're not really loving. They have to be both. You know, you can, you can say things that are, um, and sometimes you can say things that are true that aren't loving. So 
Um, you don't want to do either one. <laughs> um, we've all probably done both, um, for sure, at various points. So it's good to combine those two. Um, well, the elders of Israel came, and they, at the bottom of 381, this is chapter 14. The elders of Israel have come again to Ezekiel, and God says, these men have set up idols in their hearts. That had to be hard for Ezekiel to hear, because they're the elders. Now, how, how important is it to have true elders in our church, in our community? How often do we listen to our elders? You know, people that are, um, it doesn't matter how old you are biologically, you can have somebody that's, I think, young, you know, age-wise, but they could be an elder in their in their spirit. You can have somebody that's really, they could be 95 and not be an elder in terms of their spiritual um, gifts and wisdom. But the, it's a problem when the elders of Israel come and they have set up idols in their hearts. Because if they can't guide people, who can? Um, so God, God points to that. Therefore, repent, turn from your idols, and renounce all your detestable practices. That word's got a lot of, a lot of loaded meaning today, repent, repent. But remember, that's the first sermon, first message Jesus brings. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. So it can't just be a word of, um, you know, I think oftentimes we hear that today and we think, oh, that word, it kind of, it's been misused in a lot of ways or abused. But repent in the Greek is metanoia. It means turn around. You know, you're going this way and do the 180 or have a change of mind, change of heart. So that's that's what God calls them to there. 382, this is an interesting um passage that God uh, presents to Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, if a country sins against me by being unfaithful and I stretch out my hand against it, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, they can only save themselves by their righteousness, declares the sovereign Lord. All right, I have to ask, why those three? Of all the people God could have said, if these three were living in this land, what do, you, what do you know about these three? Do they have anything in common you can think of? Um, or characteristics, why God might reference them here? They were always faithful through adversity. Yeah. Faithful in adversity, yeah. You can't get much more adversity than a boat on top of water for 40 days. Uh, you can't get much more adversity than Daniel, who's in Babylon, or Job, who loses everything. Anything else with those three? Well, what they did was very righteous. I mean, their lives, they, they, they led, you know, if we were to judge them as humans, we'd have said, we'd yeah. lift them up. These are righteous. They're heroes. They're, they're heroes, heroes of, faith. of faith. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. They, they're heroic in their faith. Um, and, and I think what this is alluding to is remember back in Genesis, when God is about to judge Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abram comes to God and says, um, Lord, what if there's just 50 righteous people? Will you save the city? God says, well, yeah. What if there's just 40? What if there's just 30? And eventually, there's not even a handful that are found. But God's saying, look, if even if these three heroes of the faith were to come and plead on behalf of the people, that's how bad things were. Um, and then again, a little further down, if these three men were in it, they could not save their own sons or daughters, they alone would be saved. And a little further down, even if they were to come again, they would save only themselves by their righteousness. And so there's, with it being repeated three times, there's some real emphasis there. What's the good news in this? Who pleads on our behalf? Jesus. Yeah. Moses and Noah and Job and Daniel and Ezekiel, that they go and stand in front of God and say, look, Lord, forgive them. Uh, the punishment's paid. God's saying they can't do it. They live, they, they live by faith. They trusted in the word, but they can't take away the, the consequence of sin. But who can? Jesus, the son of the king. And who, did, who pleads to 
to save us, him. Therefore, uh, he is the one who rescues us. So that is a powerful, um, I think, a comfort we know is from a gospel perspective. Bottom of, um, here, Libby asked the question, how do we discern the false prophets from the real prophets? Is the devil involved in, in this confusion? Great question. Let me open that up. Do you all have any thoughts on that? How do we discern false prophets from real prophets? I think you or Scott the other day said the true prophets tell, tell terrible things and the false prophets say everything's okay. Whatever you're doing is okay. Which is lying. <laughs> yep. Which is, a, yeah, which is false. It's not, not speaking truth in love. And you have to distinguish between saying, look, everything will be okay because of Christ versus saying everything is just going to be okay. There's a huge, vast difference there. We, when we say everything is going to be okay in, in a gospel way, we say that's because of, of Jesus who has brought that um, judgment upon himself. He's, he's born the sin of the world. The other thing Jesus talks about in Matthew's gospel is he says, you'll know them by their fruits. You know, you, a good tree can't bear bad fruit, and a bad tree can't bear bad fruit. And so um, over time, the fruits of the Holy Spirit will make themselves known. That if, if love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, if those are present with the, the teaching, um, that's a good confirmation of, tr of the transformation in Christ. But if, if you have somebody who's claiming to speak on God's behalf, but um, there, you know, there's no evidence of the fruit of the Spirit. I mean, look, we're all, all preachers, all prophets. We're all, all of us. We're all sinners. We all fall short. But still, the Bible is pretty clear. The fruit should be manifest. They should outwardly make the Spirit known. Um, so I think that's a good way Jesus points to that, too. All right, bottom of 383, we get an allegory. There's this really interesting um, allegory about Israel and God's relationship with her. When's the last time you were completely at a loss of words? You think of a time that something so good happened, you were just speechless. You couldn't, you couldn't even begin to respond. I'm trying to think um, uh, of an example. Hold that in mind, because, um, yeah, right now, right now I'm at a loss for it. But that's what's going to happen in this allegory, because um, this, is what, this is what God says. Confront Jerusalem with their practices and say, uh, your ancestry and birth were in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Amorite, your mother a Hittite. On the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water. Um, no one looked on you with pity or compassion. Rather, you were thrown into the open field from the day you were born. You were despised. So this was a common practice in the ancient world that children would just be abandoned, left out to the elements. In fact, one of the ways that Christians became um, beloved in the early church was that when the Greeks and the Romans would do that, the church would go rescue these little babies and would raise them for, uh, they would take care of them. And the church or the ancient world would go, who are you people? Why would you do that? I mean, they're clearly they've been abandoned for some reason, but they would, they would do that. So God says, that's what Israel was like. They were abandoned in this field. And I passed by and I saw you there, you know, sadly, it says, you know, kicking in your own blood. And what did I say to you? Live. Live, you know, the power of the word of God. I made you grow like a plant of the field. And later when I passed by, I looked at you. I saw you were old enough for love. I spread the cover of my garment over you, covered your nakedness, and I gave an oath and a covenant. So in story form, we're being given this, obviously, this illustration of God's relationship with Israel. He dresses her in fine linen and gives her jewelry, calls her the most beautiful. She becomes a queen at the bottom of 383. And your fame spreads among the nations on account of your beauty. 
And so this is part one of the story. And, you know, um, a reflection of God's goodness, that God made Israel to be this beautiful people. Um, kind of like I was trying to talk about in the sermon this past Sunday, this contrast society. They were to live in a, a different way. This was God's dream. But instead, here's the pride again, like the pride of Edom, Obadiah talked about. You trusted in your own beauty, used your fame, and you became a prostitute. And so then Ezekiel is going to use this prostitute metaphor for the unfaithfulness of, um, of Israel all the way down. And, you know, talks about how just how heartbreaking this is for God um, to see this. And, um, and then it goes on further on 385. Um, the bottom of 385 says, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her sisters, daughters, where they were arrogant, overfed, and concerned they didn't help the poor, the needy. In other words, all the kind of the ways of the law, they've been abandoned and um, broken. And so at this point, when this beautiful um, a bride, this beautiful queen of God has done all of this, you would expect in human terms for the relationship to be done, that it'd be over. You know, you've, you've completely blown it in every way possible. But then it says, middle of page 386, and this is in chapter 16 still at the end. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I will deal with you as you deserve because you despise my oath, breaking the covenant. Here's the judgment piece, but I will remember the covenant I made with you in the days of your youth. I'll establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you'll remember your ways, be ashamed when you receive your sisters and so on. When I make atonement for you and for all you've done, you'll remember and be ashamed and never again open your mouth. In other words, you'll just be, you'll be speechless because of, um, this new covenant that yes there's this punishment but god is going to make atonement and if you break that word down atonement it means at one meant god is going to make them one again through the cross and um so i think again it's a prophecy of that new covenant that we heard about in jeremiah a couple other things um another allegory this kind of a hard one to understand, but it's about these two eagles and the, um, the tree. So the first eagle with great, powerful wings represents um, Nebuchadnezzar, the em emperor of Babylon. He comes and he plucks off the top of the cedar, and what's being represented there is um, God's people and um, the king, Jehoiachin. Uh, who was before Zedekiah. And so he takes them off and plants them in this other land. And then there's this um, other seed, like a vine that stays. And what that represents is Zedekiah, the last king before the exile. He's this vine that's now going to stay behind and spread. But all of a sudden, this other eagle comes along, and the vine that's still behind starts to face the second eagle. And... Um, the second eagle is um, is Egypt. So again, I only know this because I, I looked it up and studied the, um, <laughs> the commentary because there's no way you would know this just from the text. But what's being conveyed here is that after Nebuchadnezzar is invading and at their gate, rather than continue to trust God, the vine that's still there looks to Egypt for help. And so because of that, um, there's this, again, further judgment that they, and remember last time we talked about with um, with Isaiah and Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah said, don't trust in Egypt, and they did, and so this is a symbolic story about that, but at the end, God says, I'm going to take a part of a tree and plant it, birds of the air will come and nest in it, and I, the Lord, will bring down the tall tree, make the low tree grow so a couple of little references that Jesus, I think, plays on with this. Remember the parable of the mustard seed. You're going to plant this little seed. It'll grow, and all the birds of the, of the, of the nations will come and rest in its branches. I think he's 
giving a little nod to Ezekiel there, but also the tree of the cross, that the tree that God's going to plant will be, um, will be that tree. All right. One final thing. Which gate did the glory of the Lord depart from? East. East. The east gate. All right. So I hope that having read Ezekiel now, you're never going to hear and experience Palm Sunday quite the same way. At the end of Ezekiel, we're going to hear about the promise of um, the glory of God coming back to Jerusalem. And, uh, and it does. It comes back when the second temple is rebuilt. But ultimately, it's going to come back in who? Jesus. In Jesus Christ. On the last week of his life, when, um, when Jesus is uh, uh, going into Jerusalem, the Sunday before um, Good Friday, remember he gets the donkey and he uh, has never been ridden on. And he starts off in on what mountain before he goes up to Jerusalem city. What is called the Mount of what? Olives. Olives. Olives, that's right. Which is on the east side of the city. And so here's Jesus, and he's um, being lauded as the king, as people are saying, you know, um, Hosanna, praise to you, O Christ. And Jesus rides up on this little um, colt, which is going to be predicted in the um, prophet Zechariah. We'll come to in a few more weeks. So he's fulfilling one of the prophecies by doing that. He rides up to the city as people are praising him. The Pharisees are scowling. And who does this guy think he is? And Jesus says, if, if they're quiet, the stones will cry out. And he gets out and it says he goes into the temple. And he looks around at the end of the day. And then he goes back out for the night. But I think what, what the gospel writers are are pointing to is who has come back into the temple? The glory of the Lord. The glory of God that departed in, in Israel when because of our human sin, our brokenness that left, has come back fully in the Son, in the person of Christ. And he's come in through the same gate that he left, through the east side of the city, through the gate of the, of the Son. Um, so when we find that that's, uh, that's pointed to, you know, why he would come from the Mount of Olives, it was a place that he liked to pray, but there's also, I think, that um, message being conveyed uh, here. So when you read that, uh, when you hear that story in Mark 11, or Luke 22, I think it is, in fact, go back and read that, uh, maybe tonight. Go back and read um, the story of Palm Sunday. Yeah, it's Mark, um, and the, um, yeah, the triumph, Mark 11, and he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple, and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So there's that glory of God coming back into the temple. All right, any other questions, thoughts, things you noticed in Ezekiel? One thing when you ask about um, an example of when they, you, it's so wonderful you can't talk is when you see um, these different videos we see on TV when these soldiers come back and their children are surprised. And the children rush up there and they don't say anything. You know, they just hug and cry because they're so happy. They can't talk. Yeah. Yeah. Great example for today. Mm -hmm. And it's just an overwhelmingly good silence. Yeah. You think about what well, is that old song? I can only imagine what it, what it will be like to see Jesus someday and you know, will I stand in your presence? Will in all will I be still? Um, but uh, just that maybe we'll all be speechless in some extent at the goodness of His grace. Mm -hmm. Well, next week we'll look at the second half of Ezekiel, and um, we'll hear. And he's going to talk more about God's faithfulness to them as they're in this exile period, 
And he's going to also talk about the glory of God coming back, um, coming back to Jerusalem. God's not giving up on that dream. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight and peace be with you. Hope you have a good rest of the week. And thank you. See you, you next too. Week. Thank, thank you, so Drew. Much. Thanks, Drew. You're welcome. <laughs>